Have you ever witnessed something unexpected while walking through the woods? Are we being visited by creatures from another galaxy? What would you do if an entity completely paralyzed your body? Have you ever witnessed something unexpected while walking through the woods? Are we being visited by creatures from another galaxy? What would you do if an entity completely paralyzed your body? Today, we test the believability of the Madeline Arnu, Marius DeWild, and Maurice Moss alien encounters. Welcome to Believing the Bazaar. Where we dive into the unknown and the unusual. And tell you whether or not we find it believable. That is right. We got aliens today. That's the through line. The yeah. second through line is they're all taking place in France. They're French aliens? No, the people are French. <laughs> oh, okay. But they might be French. You know what? I'm sorry. They might be French aliens. Are they aliens then? Yes, in, they Instead are. of abducting your cow. They're, they're not abducting the cows. They're abducting the cheese. <laughs> I love a good brie. So, yeah, three stories. They're a little bit on the shorter end, so it felt good to pair them up. All take place in France, so that's how I sleep at night, knowing that there's some connection to these stories. Sure. For a, just a, random a, connections. For a complete episode. Reminder for all y'all out there. Well, first of all, you know what? First of all, if you caught us May 3rd for Believing the Boozar, we appreciate you. We, we thank you. I've just sobered up. We got through it. Charlie's now finally sober. Yeah. If you haven't seen it and you want to go back and and enjoy it you can do so on youtube we have the whole thing up on youtube it's all up there now you can't win the giveaways those are already done (laughs) don't message me and be like hey around the two hour and 12 minute mark i said this it's too late (laughs) it's too late but you can go back and watch it Um, i'm excited that we got some alien stories sources include strange 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 mary evans picture book list first and link springer Strange, strange, strange sounds like a uh, place you shouldn't go after dark. While listening to Sing, Sing, Sing? Yes. So this first story involves Madeline Arnoux. And okay. if you're wondering how that's spelled, it's A-R-N-O-U-X. I wasn't, but now I know. Arnoux. Arnoux. So this takes place in 1944 in uh, toulon sur 1944 during yeah. the war. Yeah, I I I mentioned that in here. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to no, your no, 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 no. I'm I'm I knew that you would call that out. Oh, okay. Me reading it the first time, I'm like, la la, that's interesting. <laughs> I wonder what France was like. It was not good. It was real bad. Yeah. So during the summer of '44 in rural France, 13 year old Madeline was going about her business on a hot afternoon. Going to pick up some food at a nearby farm. Avoiding Germans. Yeah. This is around World War II. And some sources consider that where Madeline was going to this farm, it was black market food that she was picking up. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Because everything was rationed. Yes. Which sucks. And distributed to the Germans. They they got it first? Oh, yeah. What leftovers do you think? It was like the ends, the crusty parts of the baguettes. It was like the ratatouille. It's like the stems of the broccoli. Ugh. Yeah, you don't want that. Oh, I actually quite enjoy the stems. Do you? When you open a frozen bag and it's all stems, I'm like, I want my oh, money no, no. back. I don't, I don't, I don't cook frozen broccoli. I make, I get it fresh and I cut it. You've never bought a frozen bag of broccoli? Not in many, many years. Okay. So anyway, in the sweltering heat, Madeline was riding her bicycle, pedaling harder and harder to get there quickly so she could make this trip over quickly because the sun was beaten down. However, she hit a point where she felt a bit exhausted likely due to the heat, and noticed that there was a nearby meadow that bordered the woods on her biking path. So she decided what harm would it be to take a small break, cool down in the shade from the trees, and pick a few berries, because there were supposedly some berries over there. Black market, underground, <laughs> dark web berries. <laughs> but the berries weren't as readily available as she hoped, but seeking them out, she began making her way down a trail that led off into these trees. And at this point, the curiosity got the best of her. She kept walking and walking, forgetting about the berries and the farm, and found herself more entranced following this path. And the trail veered off and disappeared around a bend through the trees. As she reached the curve, 
It was at this point that she noticed something incredibly strange. Madeline claimed that sitting just a few hundred meters away was something that she'd never seen before. It was something gray, round, and metallic. Something around the size of a standard car. She described the outer layer of this craft as appearing very smooth, but it had no visible openings, doors, or windows. As she was studying the spacecraft in awe, something moved and caught her eye. She realized that she was not alone in the woods. Surrounding this craft were tiny humanoid creatures. She claimed that they were only about one meter or so tall, and they were dressed in brown one-piece suits. Here's a quote from Madeline. They did not make any gesture in my direction, and as to me, I was frozen on the spot. How much time did this mutual observation last? I cannot say, but I remember the oppressive atmosphere, still worsened by the thundery weather and of my impression to be unable to move. Suddenly, I managed to react and wanted to pick up my bicycle again, which lay within just a few meters. The time to bend down, and by looking up at the strange appearance again, there was nothing more. Only at this place, the trees were agitated by a violent wind. I did not think of looking up in the air, where I would have undoubtedly still seen the machine which flew away. Go ahead. So, she's walking through the woods. Yeah. She sees this metallic craft. Yeah. And it's strange. There's no doors, no windows. But then she notices, I don't know if she's looking up or it's just the distance. She sees these one meter tall creatures in brown suits. And she's like frozen, whether it's fear or Mm -hmm. something else. Frozen, feels unable to move. The weather all of a sudden gets really intense and thundery, as she says. And she goes, finally is like released from the spell, goes to get her bicycle, looks up and they're gone. But also aware she didn't want to look up, up. Because she thought the ship would be up there. Well, she said undoubtedly the machine which flew away. So she's maybe she like caught it out of the corner of her eye. I don't know. She saw and like, yeah, kind of like a note when there's that scene. Um, yeah, yeah. When the light, when uh, the fir- almost like one of the first times. Spoiler alert, I guess when the, the farm like he's at the end of the farm and he sees them like practicing and the lights get really bright. Yeah, and then they dim and he looks and he just sees it like f- kind of float off. I don't know, man. This story. She saw, she's, she's talking about going through the woods and like there's like this tunnel. There's Almost. no tunnel. There's no tunnel. It's a trail. Okay. There's no right. tunnel. Felt like it like tunneled out. No, nope. whatever you're trying to change this into, there's no tunnel. <laughs> just saying. Nope, just a trail and a flying saucer, Charlie. Sounds a little bit like fairies to me. Small little guys in suits. I don't know. I'm just saying. So, uh, understandably, she's freaked out and terrified. And she says, F- the Bowie's. And rode her bicycle home as quickly as she could. Yeah. Apparently, also deciding to leave the black market milk and cheese behind, too. She didn't bring the food back? No, she never even made it there. She oh. stopped for the berries on the way, so she went home. Man. It's, it makes me think of this, like, rebel cow in a trench coat. <laughs> and he, like, opens up <laughs> his like, coat, and it's got one of those, like, Dean cartons. Instead of, of watches, milk, it's, like, milk yeah. cartons. <laughs> Give me that 2%. Uh, so she's pedaling yeah. fast, trying to get away from the spacecraft and those creatures. At the time, she feared that no one would believe her. Her friends wouldn't believe her. Her parents wouldn't believe her. So she's thinking, what's the point of telling anyone at all? Just so they can make fun of her or, you know, there's just nothing good that comes from it. Plus, there's all these other things happening, too. Yeah, like whole war. When war is happening, you want to be like, but aliens. <laughs> she also wasn't, like, super aware of aliens at this point, either. It's not like now. Right, right, right. So she ended up keeping this encounter to herself for many years, trying her best to repress and forget that it ever happened. And, again, she's 13, this is the 40s, there's no X-Files, there's no Invader Zim. Like, she has nothing to draw to. You know, we have so much media and Mm -hmm. stories and the internet and YouTube and TikTok where we can be like, oh, those are the signs of an alien. And like, no, it's fake. But, you know, she didn't have that. (laughs) Right, right. She had nothing. She had farms and baguettes. So, what was she thinking then? It was something strange. Just something strange. Just something strange. Supernatural. It was something unusual and i don't want to bring it up because it freaks me out and no one's probably going to believe me anyways okay for now but eventually as she grew older and wiser she learned more about ufo phenomena and realized that a lot of those stories and descriptions matched her own experience to a t so here's another quote from madeline quote a long time i thought of this strange encounter and then i forgot it it was necessary 
that one starts to speak of the quote flying saucers for me to th- make a link and that I think that I had undoubtedly seen one of these mysterious UFOs. And so, many years, the image is still very clear in my memory, and I know I had not dreamed, and that what I saw and would that day was not nothing, quote, known. It could not have been a vehicle of that time. Moreover, they were rather rare, so that I undoubtedly identify it. The place of the encounter was deserted. The way leads into the wood. The closest farms were at one kilometer. We were in 1944. The men of the resistance were numerous in the area, but it could not have been any of them. Neither German soldiers, and undoubtedly one or the others, would have called me. It is thus necessary to think that I witnessed one of the first visits of UFOs. Unquote. Yeah, this was before Roswell. Isn't it the same year? Does that happen in 1944? Yeah. I thought it happened after the nuke. That... Yeah, I just know it's maybe it was 47. Yeah, because I thought that was the big deal about Roswell is because they had started to come. Yeah, because we had used the nuke. Yeah, because this is a year before, if you didn't know. (laughs) Spoiler. (laughs) Yeah, Roswell is 47. Okay, so so this is before Roswell. She's like, uh, Dibs, first one. Yeah. First comment, you know. Although I wonder if like, it's so let's pretend right now they are aliens and not what I think they are. Do you think they're observing the war, essentially? like, I'm glad you brought up Roswell, because that is a good narrative that I don't think I would have just thought of on my own. Yeah, maybe they're like, this, this shit's crazy. Yeah, this, this is popping off. This is crazy. This is insane. But I wonder if it's because they are observing this war, they knew something was going to happen, or they even had more intel. I don't know. Or less. It might have just been like, there's a disturbance happening on this planet. Let's check it out. Yeah. This dude's mustache is way too small. (laughs) I love watching uh, war movies. So maybe they just like watching They're just like you. Yeah. They're like, have you seen Dunkirk? (laughs) I've seen the real... That's not... What... what, uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan. That's a World War II, isn't it? So is Dunkirk. Uh, Is it Dunkirk? Yes. I haven't seen either. I've seen... Sorry. I've seen Saving Private Ryan. There's the the Normandy scene is insane. Yes, it is. It's it's like the first scene. In that movie? Yeah. Okay. That's how it starts. It's been a long time. That's how it starts. That's why it's so... But yeah, it's imagine. But that's my point. I wonder if they're observing because of this disturbance. I think it's a good theory. I mean, but it's also, well, I don't know, like 40s through the 70s, aliens are just popping off, man. It's like, like, you know, it's, you know, it is, it's like when a highway reroutes, you know, there's a detour. It's like, instead of taking the highway straight, we're fixing this road. And you got to, you got to take exit 12. That's your detour. So you're going to go through these side streets that you've never gone through before to get back on the highway. And, but it's only going to be for a couple months. And for them, it's like, okay, here's the alien highway. Oh no. Galactic construction. So for 30 years, you're going to have to go past earth. And they're like, well, we might as well check it out. Okay. It's the world's smallest mustache. I thought that's what you were going with that. They make I I don't I, think that there's makes been sense. shit since the 70s. I'm just saying 40s mm-hmm. through the 70s is like nonstop. I mean, yeah. it could be, if you if you don't believe in aliens and you think it's government technology, mm-hmm. and that also fits then because that's a, a time of a lot of rapid production there. But I mean, I'm not saying there hasn't been alien things since. But also, it's like, well, you know, then they're like, well, remember that one place we went in the 40s? Yeah, Let's check that place out again. Let's also talk about the size of these things. One meter. One meter that she saw from. A hundred meters away. Yeah. She forgot that she mentioned she brought her binoculars berry <laughs> hunting. Yeah, that's pretty far. That's uh I think that's like three football fields away. That's really far. Yeah. So So maybe there weren't one meter? Maybe they were smaller. There, there's no way they're or smaller. Or they were bigger. They had to be bigger. They must have been bigger. Yeah, that's actually like that's the most skepticism this story gets from current day ufologists. Is they're like that was a really long distance that she's making this claim. Yeah. Unless, like, in her defense, maybe maybe she was wrong about that. Like, that could have been a, a terrible estimate. And we joke and, and honestly also believe that some of the estimates that people make in these stories we talk about are like, how did you just whip that out? But yeah. we are also people that can't just eye things like that. Maybe Madeline's maybe not can't either. either. Yeah, she's 13 she was 13. Year old girl. She doesn't know. She's not. She's, she's probably on her phone. She didn't even see this. <laughs> it's just a piece of wood. <laughs> just looking back over the note, a few hundred. That's so far. Oh that's my goodness. crazy. Man, she she had to have been mistaken. And and that's meters big. 
Meters are, I know it's a dumb thing to say that way, but meters, meters, are, meters big. Meters are big. Like, I don't think I'm even two meters tall. We're not. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> and I think, I think that it used to be like six T over something to be a couple meters tall. Okay. So back, back to the story. So she's like, it wasn't German soldiers. I, I've now seen other examples of UFO phenomenon. Yeah. I believe that's what I saw. So she's like, I got to do something about this. I got to tell someone. So almost 30 years after her berry picking UFO experience, she wrote a letter to a ufologist named Fernand Lagarde. Her experience that she detailed in the letter ended up being published in the French ufology magazine Lumières dans la nuit, which is something in the night. While she received some feedback mail, no one ever visited Madeline or went to her property to investigate. Probably because it's almost 30 years old, in my opinion. It's not like it lives there. It was, right. it was like, are you going to look for markings on the ground from 30 years ago? But here's another quote from Madeline. Quote, whereas I received a lot of mail after the publication of the article in question, many wrote to me to interrogate me and asked me to report the facts. I was even told that a young man of toulon sur aru studying with the UCLA University of Los Angeles, <laughs> a few years later, had read my article in an American magazine in the very library of this prestigious university. But it seems that my modest person did not interest the investigators, for never nobody came to my home. Whether some journalists came on the spot, that is quite possible, but they never met with me. I went back to the place myself ten years ago. Everything was changed, and if I did not have the memory of this true photographic impression of the scene from July of 1944, I could not have recognized anything, end quote. So even the vegetation, mm. the, the trail, the it's woods. It's all kind of... It's, yeah. it's a McDonald's now. <laughs> it's interesting, though. I just, just... I mean, just how time changes things. And she's like, it's all different. I does, Would it really matter anyway, though? Well, there'd be the nostalgia aspect of it. Like, if you had a traumatic event somewhere and you went yeah. back and it looked the same, it probably would hit you harder than if it I looked guess, completely different. Yeah, like, you sense. know how in, like, Grand Theft Auto V, they completely changed Grove Street, which is the dumbest thing they could have done? You tell me, like, if you can go back to an original location, different game, in a future game, keep it the same. That's, yeah. Metal Gear Solid 4 did that really well with Shadow Moses. I'll just leave it at that. So, she was kind of bummed that no one went and talked to her. She wanted that clout. Yeah, she did. You get vibes of that in this. Like, no one came to talk to me. I reached out. Mm -hmm. I was the first UFO experience here. Yeah. It's, you know. You can see it. Yeah. You can see it. She wants it. And apparently in 1996, she reached out to a different ufologist. Michel Figue, and claimed that there actually was another possible UFO sighting in 1942 in Toulon-sur-Aru. Oh. And here's what she wrote to Michel. Quote, I might add something all the same to bring back facts that came back to my memory after the publication of the article, which perhaps does not have any relationship with the occurrence, but which are rather odd. A few years before, i.e. the first years of the war, perhaps in 1942, almost every evening during the summer i think and during several days in a row the district where i lived with my parents the suburb was in agitation indeed we managed to observe a whitish gleam slightly shining moon in the sky roughly at a point located in the northwest this gleam was motionless sometimes seemed to die out a little and then was revived needless to tell you that each evening there was a gathering of all of the district and everyone went out with their comments and guesses admittedly compromising only tethered balloons. A zeppelin, a blimp. I know that courageous young men went in that day to check the surroundings and never saw anything. Now, I'm about sure that in straight line, the place where we could see this luminous and fixed object was located in the vertical of the place where I saw just a few years later my UFO. Was there a connection between these occurrences? Did they observe us already from above before landing? Unquote. So they're seeing this like moon-like object yeah a silver disc in the sky and she claims that vertically like if you go and drop straight down 90 degrees mm -hmm. that it was almost right about where she had her experience two years later but but why why though that's the weirdest part like why we'll, we'll never random, get the why but this random spot in the middle of france where wouldn't be random you know what i mean like any location you pick is you know what i mean it's like it, it feels random but anywhere, unless it's like New York, Paris, Most LA. Like you know. Well, Paris, it's right there. Yeah, but I mean, maybe they don't want to be observed. 
So okay. they're going somewhere rural. Makes sense. Any, I'm just I'm I'm just saying anywhere would feel a little random unless it was like I guess so. Like um when we did the Battle of um Frankfurt, mm-hmm. that felt random. Everything. Kelly Hopkinsville, you know? Uh well, Point Pleasant. All these places are random unless you go into like ley lines. That's maybe this is on a ley line. Maybe. I don't know. I think that magazine was Illumination of the Night. Sure. That sounds good. I think so. It's a good name. We should make that American version. <laughs> Shit. The Nightly Illumination. There we go. Let's just call it the Illuminati. What do you think? <laughs> I'm into it, yeah. Over the years, Madeline had discounted those who wondered whether maybe she just saw German soldiers or perhaps members of the French resistance, or even that she imagined the whole thing, and she's just crazy. But she always states that if it was soldiers, whether it was resistance or German, they very well would have approached her, even though they were like A couple 500. couple hundred meters away? Yeah. He's like, is that something over there? He's like, I can't tell. Yeah. It's probably not black market berries. <laughs> I feel like if it was like Germans, they just would have shot her. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. So that's Madeline's story. Let's move on to our second French alien encounter. All right, this story is about Marius de Wilde, and it takes place in 1954. Yes, mm. it is chronological. And yes, this also is in France. Yes, I can't think of anything significant that happened in 1954. Maybe I'm just being silly. So it was a cool September evening in 1954 when Marius de Wilde, a dedicated railway worker, was settling in for the night in his home near a railway station in Nord, France. Oh, okay. I have trouble with railway, real world. I notice I... Railway. Yeah, it's rare. rare. It's, rare. it's very silly. That's silly. So while preparing for sleep, he had no idea how remarkable this evening would be. Right around 10.30 p.m., Marius's faithful dog began to bark hysterically. And this was very unusual of his pup. Drop the dog's name. I don't have the dog. No. This was very unusual of his pup, according to Marius. At first, he tried to ignore all the commotion, but as the barking persisted, he knew that something was going on. So, he groggily got out of bed, grabbed his flashlight, and ventured outside to see what was going on. Sucker, boo, what's going on? (laughs) (laughs) Dude, the world of flashlights is insane. We are so lucky with our phones. Oh, yeah. We always have a flashlight. My my father-in-law, Jim, carried a flashlight for, I think he still has a flashlight that he has in the car, but... He, he was very adamant that we should get flashlights in our house. I did not get flashlights in my house. No, I, uh, when I go up to bed for my, with my son, I tell him to get his flashlight out because it's dark in the hallway. Yeah. So I get my phone out. And he just puts his hand out like it's a flashlight. <laughs> so dog's barking, gets his flashlight, trying to figure out what is going on, thinking it's probably just a stray cat or some other animal running around. So as he approached the tracks, because he's right by the railway yeah, tracks. Yeah, sure. Um, just about six or seven meters away, significantly closer, the Madeline story, mm-hmm. Marius spotted a strange looking object near these tracks. Not only did he see something, but he heard something too. Footsteps behind him. So he swung around, swung his flashlight around, and he came face to face with two small humanoid figures, each standing about one meter tall. Their heads, when illuminated by Marius's flashlight, reflected the light as if they were wearing mirror helmets. Before Marius could react, a beam of light shot out of the object on the tracks and just absolutely paralyzed him. So he's frozen. He's frozen in place, unable to move at all. If I remember correctly, this is dating a little bit here. That's kind of like what happened in Pascagoula, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Charlie and mm-hmm. the other guy yeah. <laughs> got <laughs> frozen. And they got carried. Now, in this case, that's not what happened. His flashlight, he noticed, that he was holding flickered and completely went out. Like, the battery just completely got drained. So, he's helpless, and he watched as this door opened on the object by the tracks, and these mysterious beings boarded the craft. As it ascended into the sky, the object changed colors, leaving Marius awestruck, despite this very horrifying situation. As it was rising, flying away a few moments later... His body was released. When he finally regained his mobility, Marius rushed to tell his wife and the neighbor, in that order, about this incredible encounter. But neither of them had seen or heard a thing. Desperate for someone to believe him, Marius contacted the local police. To his surprise, which is fair, 
to have a surprise reaction. Yeah. The officers arrived at the scene. <laughs> when I got my car broken into, they're like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> like, I, I should have said there was an alien in our parking lot. And they came. They came and said, they wow, came. this is incredible. This is interesting. But what, what was the point? Well, though? they found Marius. Well, he was just going to talk through what happened. Yeah. Because he feels a little violated. He was frozen. And I've, he saw these beings. He's one meter tall. I've never talked. I've never called the police to talk through anything. You've never called the police? To talk through anything. What does that mean? Like, to talk through a situation. Like, like a good friend or a counselor. I had to call the police one time with Ethan when I was walking Annie. And it was very weird because it had nothing to do with me, but I'm a big night walker and my friend Ethan was walking. This is like 2019. Yeah. And we were walking with my dog at the time and we just heard a woman shouting, things falling over. So we called 911. It was weird because it's like it wasn't had nothing to do with us. He was like, yeah, what are you guys doing? It's like, we're just walking. What what do you mean? (laughs) He was like, where are you at? And it was like the corner of this and this. And let me tell you. And like. Less than 90 seconds, two cop cars came. Did which you was just, awesome. like, jump in the bushes and just, like, peek? No, we, we stayed on... Well, we stayed out on the sidewalk waiting to see if the police officers wanted to talk with us. Yeah. But they were very focused on the house. One went around the back, one went in the front. So we were like, okay, two cops came. Neither of them stopped to talk to us. I was like, okay. Let's just quietly walk into the night. Yeah. Domestic, domestic violence is a very dangerous situation. Oh, it's, I mean, it's scary. And it's like, and uh, I feel bad if it was like I was wrong, but I'd rather be wrong than, than, than yeah. something worse happened. Yeah. Very least they broke something very heavy in the house. <laughs> so anyways, cops come because they want to check in on the situation. He, no one's believing him either. He needs that validation. He got frozen. His flashlight's dead. Yeah. Someone needs to pay. So the cops come. And one interesting detail is, obviously, they're like, well, show us where it happened, what went down. Marius could not approach the exact spot where it happened. Every time he got near it, it was just this intense nausea. Really? But it was, like, clear cut. Like, he moved, it was fine. Uh Got closer to it, nauseous. So he literally couldn't, I mean, he probably could give him a garbage can or something. But he, he resisted the urge because of his body to go back to that exact location. I wonder if it's like a radiation field or something. I mean, it's something entered his body. Yeah. And it froze him or it affected his body. So that would make sense. I have a very real, but maybe stupid question. How do they have batteries then for the flashlight or like in how, the do 50s, they, how do they charge there were it? batteries in the 50s? Okay. I did not know. Yeah. I don't know if it was like energizer bunny, but there was something. <laughs> okay. It was a crank. <laughs> he cranked it. <laughs> For hours before bed, you crank it just in that's case you might so have to upset. use the bathroom. Yeah, that's why he was so mad that they died. Yeah, he's got huge biceps, though. <laughs> so he can't approach the spot. His flashlight's dead. His telephone was no longer working. So because of those little details, these police officers were like, I actually believe this guy. I don't think this is a hoax. So as dawn broke, investigators began swarming the area, and a passing train came to a screeching halt on the tracks, which made a really loud noise but it was approaching the site of the encounter and there was something that stopped the train so upon closer inspection a six meter depression was discovered on the exact spot where the object had landed and small rocks beneath the train tracks were found to be carbonized and the sleepers between the steel lines bore symmetric marks so there was actual physical evidence both in the rocks and the tracks in the surrounding dirt area that something landed wow it's a sleeper. Is that like a person? That's some detail of a train track. Train, train if, thing. If anyone out there has ever laid train tracks, tracks. that aren't Tonka, you probably have, you know you what know, I'm a sleeper about. is. I'll be honest. I actually Wikipedia sleeper afterwards. Yeah. And once it started saying it was part of it, I'm like, that's fine. That's all I need to know. <laughs> part of train tracks. Some stuff I try to understand. Some stuff I'm fine knowing. That's fine. Yeah. And that, that stays in the knowing category. So the incident quickly gained notoriety thanks to the local magazine Radar. Within days of the initial experience, he found himself surrounded by government investigators, the press, onlookers, everybody that Madeline wanted. <laughs> How, <laughs> however, <It's hard. laughs> you know, you it. it was all within her reach, but she never got it. Well, you know, six meters is a little bit different. Yes, it is. Then several hundred. However, the first story didn't end there. In the days that followed, Marius suffered respiratory problems. And tragically, his dog, the one that was barking hysterically, died just three days after the encounter. No. And then nearby farms reported mysterious deaths of three cows, claiming that their blood was inexplicably drained. Yo. That's bad black market product. 
Yeah. Oh, but man. somehow, some way, that is the end of Marius' story. What? That's the end? That's where we stop his story? That's where we stop his story. Surprisingly similar to Madeline's story. Oh, yeah. France, one meter, frozen. You know, that's a detail that was like, it was not clear cut in Madeline's because she is frozen, but the impression isn't that they force her to be frozen. Right. It's, it comes across that she was frozen was in fear, fear, but it's never explicitly stated. Could have just been, it could have been the same thing. Through line. And she didn't have a flashlight. It's true. But if she did, I feel like, it well, you know, been dead. I don't know. Cause it's pretty far. It's pretty long distance. You know, the range on that thing, huh? Yeah. I don't, I don't know how long they're battery draining like my camera over here. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, this story is freaky. It sucks that, like, it has, like, that black-eyed kid effect afterwards where it's, like, he had respiratory problems. It makes you feel like, like, I think when you were talking about, did you say radiation? Yes, yeah. It really seems like, and they didn't give him that metal plate either, you know? Like, the dentist. Like, this is, he's like, bite down on this. This is, it seems like there really was an elast a lasting effect. Because sometimes when you hear about, and this is an abduction story, but sometimes when you hear about abduction stories, it's like they use jelly or there's like a gas, but it almost makes it seem like when it's done, it's kind of like you're good. Mm -hmm. Like the guy whose name we can't remember from Pascual, I know he like poured bleach on himself, but it seems like outside of traumatic memories and dreams, yeah, physically, and they might have little marks, like, you know, like Mm -hmm. on their neck Mm -hmm. or their legs or something, they might have a mark, but it didn't seem to have this type of like, lasting radiation like the dog maybe the radiation killed the dog maybe but since the marius was bigger it only gave him respiratory problems i don't know if radiation can do that but i don't know yeah well i'm using radiation as a very loose term because clearly it's not like the same thing that would happen if you go to the dentist or get an x-ray i just mean like some whatever force they used on him to freeze him yeah and maybe that was like last resort for them. They're like, it's like when you stun something. Yeah. Like, I don't want to mm-hmm. kill him, but we got to stop him. We got to go. This is a two, it's a coop. We only got two <laughs> seats. He can't come with us. All right. So let's get into our third and final French alien encounter of the evening or the morning or the mid afternoon. Whatever time it is. Whenever you're listening to this, whatever year it is, it could be, it could be 2028. Favorite number. <laughs> 28, not the 2020. 2028. I didn't want to think about that. So this is a little bit of a shorter encounter. So I'm going to read this um, from list of verse. And this is Maurice Moss's encounter. Quote, in July of 1965, a very weird series of events went down in the region of Valençol, France. It all started in a small village. And on July 1st, 1965, a farmer by the name of Maurice Moss was taking a cigarette break before starting his morning chores. As he puffed out wisps of smoke in the air, something caught his attention through the haze of cigarette smoke, and he could see some sort of strange object descend from the sky to land in a field of lavender flowers not too far away. We don't know how many meters. <laughs> just give or take. At this point, he did not take it to be a UFO, thinking it instead maybe to be a helicopter. But when he extinguished his smoke and took a look out across the field, his eyes met with an oval-shaped object perched up on four leg-like apparatuses. Stranger still was that there appeared to be two humanoid figures standing in front of it. The figures were described as standing approximately four feet high and dressed in tight gray-green clothes, seemingly not human. Their heads were oversized and bald, holding within them large almond-shaped eyes and small pointed chins, and they seemed to be making some sort of low, grumbling noise. As the farmer stood there, mouth agape in awe, one of these curious figures allegedly turned to him and raised into the air a device of some kind which looked cylindrical and pencil-like in nature. Before Moss could even really register what was going on, he says that the device projected some sort of beam that caused him to lose all control of his limbs and go crumpling to the ground in a heap. He would claim that as he lay there in a daze, the figures boarded their craft and then flew off at great speed. At a later time, it was discovered that the ground had a deep indentation in it and hardened area like concrete. It would also be found that Moss was honest, very sincere, and was considered to be telling the truth. 
Mm. Unquote. Four feet tall is about one meter. It's a little higher than it, you know? Yeah. That's a good call because some people already, you got to re- remind them we're talking feet, meters. Yeah. It's right around the same. You know, they could be just one tall. He drank his, his uh, space milk. Got a good rest. <laughs> Although I wonder if, if the freezing is cl- similar to this pencil, pencil object. Like, I wonder if there's also a connection there. I don't know. This is also, I mean, this is 20 years in advance. This is 20 years after Madeline's and yeah. 10 years or so after Maurice's, or sorry, after Marius's. I don't know. It's, it's interesting because not like, <laughs> yes, they're alien stories. Yes, they take place in France. Like those, mm-hmm. that, that's a clear through line. And I said that at the top and it's obvious. But also, Silvercraft. Yep. Tiny entities yes. of anywhere between three and five feet, three and four feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And all of the three people are physically affected some way or another. It's By either frozen, yeah. frozen, or like crumpled yeah. to a heap, but that's just maybe how his body took it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just a different kind of effect. It's interesting, too, because like in throughout these three stories, we went from madeline who's like this is strange i don't know what this is but it seems supernatural whatever that means to maurice's in 1965 where he's like aware of what ufos are and he's yeah. like i don't think it's a ufo it's probably a helicopter without any propeller <laughs> and then it lands because his smoke is just so thick right he's really blown he's doing some gandalf just he's just puffing clouds and uh yeah so those are our three french alien encounters not ufo encounters technically <laughs> yes Technically, they are UFO encounters, but we're going a step further. Yeah. We're calling them alien encounters. Let's talk about it in the discussion. All right. Before we get to the discussion, we would like to stop the episode and thank our newest patrons, who, as of the recording of this podcast, include Caitlin Aspickle. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, Jessica, and Miranda. Thank you so much for joining our Patreon. There's so much bonus content. We love everything that we put out. We will explain a little bit more shortly. But one thing that I would like to highlight, it's actually coming up this month. We got to we gotta drop our prompt. Hopefully, by the time this comes out, we did. It's called Voicemail Clip. I was so scared you are going to take mine. No. Voicemail Clip. So we got a, we got a phone number. We, we're not going to answer it, but we got a, we got a phone <laughs> number. I don't answer my phone number. I'm not going to answer this phone number. It doesn't ring. Uh, I have the app on my phone. It doesn't ring. Yeah, So, but we give you a prompt. So it's like, what's your favorite horror movie? Or like, what's your favorite BTB episode? Or something like that. You call. You leave your voicemail. On this segment, we listen to your voicemail, respond to it, talk about it. It's a lot of fun. It's another fun way to engage with listeners in in a specific way of like, you know, a question answer type of thing. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. It's really cool. It's cute, cool to hear different voices. What uh, would you like to highlight? Well, something I want to highlight. I just want to point out that in the whole time we've been doing the Patreon highlights, we've only come across each other's highlight a couple times. Oh, you mean we're like, when I say my highlight is the one you had prepared. Yeah, that... And you got to quickly think of something else. That almost never happens. But we offer so much, it's so hard to narrow it down. That's my point. We do have so much. Like, that never happens. But something I want to highlight, it's also coming out this month, is the mini encounter episodes. Mm -hmm. Mine, it's going to be my mine. So I'm really excited about it. We we created like 15 pieces of bonus content before we finally listened to you guys. We were like, what do you guys want to hear? And you're like, mini episodes. And we're like, okay. okay, okay but what, but do really what, what do you really want to hear? <laughs> what, do you want director's cut? And do you want this? And they're like, no, we want mini mini encounter episodes. So we were like, okay. Okay. We'll do it. All right. We figured it out. And they're actually really cool. They're fun. Yeah. Sometimes they're themed. We've done doppelgangers. Black Eyed Kids. Black Eyed Kids. Alien abductions. Uh-huh. Sometimes they're not themed. But they're just pure encounter based, just extra encounters. Lots it's of fun. Always, always fun. So such a good time. You know what else is fun? Patreon. So Patreon's a good time. There's too. a couple different tiers. It helps helps support us a lot. It means a lot to us. But we also are very proud of and love the extra content we put out there. So if you're able to join, awesome. If not, we just appreciate that you're listening to this. But again, thank you everybody who has joined recently and always. And let's get back to the main episode. So I think our believability scale, uh, that's what we do on this podcast. We talk about an episode and we go believable, viable, skeptical, and believable. Yeah. Sometimes it's obvious. Like we just did a true crime story recently and it's oh, like, yeah. technically, that was, okay, of course, that it was happened. Believable. Yeah. And sometimes we'll do things like fairies and say, okay, of course, whoa. It's, it's unbelievable. Whoa, 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 I'm whoa. just saying that to ruffle your feathers. Yes. Yeah. They're ruffled. It's always a little difficult when we do multiple 
Yes. So I'm going to do this like a weighted scale. Like it's 33% across the board. Okay. Gotcha. So even if you truly believe one is 100% true, we're going to do this weighted. Because we don't post anymore. It's just for us fun to say. <laughs> we used to post it, and those posts would get like four likes. It's the same Not graphic. Not engagement, so that's okay. Yeah, so you just you got to listen to know. All, you know what we do is we post it on Spotify now. Oh, actually, yeah, shout true. out producer Ben. He shouted that out. It's good. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to explicitly vote on what you find these episodes believable, viable, skeptical, unbelievable, go to Spotify. This specific episode within seven days of it dropping. We know you're on Spotify. We know you're on Spotify. You can vote just like you can leave a comment. You can vote. Um. So let's go one by one by one. Okay. So yeah. Madeline, five hundred miles away. She's got great I'm, vision. She loves carrots. <laughs> and she can see the black market carrot. It's vitamin A. It's, it's good for your eyes, isn't it? It's a myth. It was, well, was actually uh, developed well, during World War II uh, because it was said the British pilots would eat carrots to have better night vision. I thought it was because you get vitamin A from carrots and vitamin A is supposedly good for your eyeballs. I think it's good for you. It's a, it's a straight up myth. So broccoli doesn't... Wait, spinach doesn't make me like super strong? Uh, you could try it, but I don't think it will help. Not putting that in my smoothies anymore. So, for me, least believable. I don't know where I'm landing yet, but the least believable just so, because of the distance. Yeah, I was going to say, it comes from the distance, right? In the clout. She's trying she wants to... It. She wants it too bad. She, I know. She's Which like, I learned from my years of dating in high school. <laughs> if you want it too bad, it doesn't happen. You can come talk to me, guys, please. They're like... She's like, they may have even came and checked out the area, but no one knocked on my door. And it, But you know what? Also, <laughs> as, her head in French. as a human being... I get it. Yeah, I don't particularly yeah. love extra attention, but to a certain degree, everybody wants some type of, you know, they, they people like feeling good. And when, yeah. when you're noticed, you know what I mean? So I understand that aspect of it. It's just like, it happened. Even the experience itself is kind of like, could have just been German soldiers? Could have yeah. been. Yeah. Or the resistance or something. And then she waits like 20 years. And then once she starts seeing people getting notoriety from saying these stories, then she says it. Yeah. And then. She doesn't get the she she gets a publication which is cool she can put that on a resume oh yeah uh, but then no one comes and then she's like oh but by, by the way two years before that all this other stuff was happening and mm-hmm. but then no one like cross checked it that I saw there was no one else like reaching out to the townsfolk and be like did you see a silver moon thing out there that you thought might have been a, ze- a blimp or a zeppelin or a balloon but that's the thing though like that's not the biggest highlight of 1944 despite it you know being aliens there is other stuff going on. Here is what I will give the most credit to, though, is that her story remarkably lines up with the other two. That's that's true. We have the same if, type. If you can point out a meter from 100 meters away. That's fair. That's fair. But let's pretend that part is accurate. Okay, sure. <laughs> let's go on that limb. The craft is similar. The beings are similar. And the reaction her body has to it is similar. Also, maybe just like... Like if someone's like, how close were you to this, you know, hundred, couple hundred meters? You know, it's just like you just threw it out there. That could like one detail that she got wrong could be the entire reason why we go under viable. That's you a know? big, that's a big guess. I'm terrible with distance. I know you are too. Not that bad. I don't know, dude. You had to look up what, how many meters, you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> I'm just saying like, if that detail is off and maybe it was like a hundred feet you know what I mean? Like, what if in like in transcribing of this story to like what all it takes is one person transcribing the story to turn it to meters instead of feet. Now that she would say she, feet, would, she wouldn't have said she feet. wouldn't have, but it could have been trans. I'm just saying translated like, then translate back. Yeah, I just, I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt because her story does mix with the other ones. But it's just like it's so far. But that is a criticism. It's I'm, not us. I'm gonna, like, other ufologists do criticize the story because they're like, that is far away. I'm going to throw this throw this out there. She's a little girl in France in the woods by herself. Maybe she ate some berries she shouldn't have been eating. I think it's more likely these are, hmm, that this is a fae trap, and these are fae than aliens. I do. I put that out I there. I go unbelievable on that. Come oh. on now. Come on. I'm going to go skeptical in general. I think this I th- is my least believable story, too. I, I think I will join you in skeptical. I'm not going to go unbelievable. Will, you, who, you and who? Hmm? I said I will join you I in skeptical. I thought you said we'll. We will all <laughs> me join and you and Charlie. In, me and everyone listening will join you in skeptical. And the probably. voice in my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I'm going to give her the, like, it's not unbelievable because it does line up with other things, but we'll go, we'll go um, skeptical. So, our second story dog barking, 
go out on the tracks. Yeah. Sees like flashlight sees this thing. Rip Flash, good dog. Flashlight's drained. Phone won't work. It's frozen. It ri- this UFO rises up. Lights are flickering. Once it flies away, he loses. He gets control again. Yeah. Cops come. He's ill when he approaches the area. Nausea. A couple of days later, dog dies. He mm. has respiratory problems. And they find an indentation exactly where it landed on the tracks. Car- um, carbonated? Is that? Carbonated stone. You not said. carbonated. What is the? Where am I room? Um, <laughs> carbon? Like, it's not like, it's not like bubbly rock. It's carbonized. Car- <laughs> <laughs> bubbly Sponsored rocks. by bubbly. Um, uh, that that was very compelling. Yes, that was very compelling. Even uh, the police officers were like, <sighs> "Wow, I think you saw an alien, bro." I'm gonna go believable. The, I mean, it's the before, the during, and the after. It's like, yeah. and it just like nothing. If you already kind of believe in aliens, there's nothing in the story that blows your mind, and not in a, like a like the the story is mind blowing. I'm just saying, if you lay out the facts and you already buy into aliens, it's kind of like. Nothing is like an outlier. Kind of like like I, they took him on a ride to Saturn, gave him a rock. <laughs> I, I remember that callback. Um, so they just like popped up behind him. Like he was looking at the spaceship, and they popped up behind him. Is that right? They were already behind him. Okay, he was looking because the dog was barking, so he was searching yeah. for a noise. Yeah, and he was walking out there, and then he heard footsteps, and then he turned and he faced them. That's my worst night. That's so scary. The footsteps just. You turn around and someone's behind you. Also, Not even an alien, also, just someone. He's saying they wore helmets that were like reflective mirrors. So it's like the light bounced back off him. Mm-hmm. It's a very creepy, unsettling. Like, yeah. I, I don't want to over, I don't want to understate that. It's like, yeah, it's an alien story. It's cool. I feel bad for the dog as well. Yeah. But it is very creepy. It's a very, because you know, I think it's the scariest story. Also, it's like, I don't know if you've ever woken up. And you slept on your arm and it's like dead. Yeah. Oh and yeah. you know, it'll come back and it'll get tingly and it hurts. But then, you know, it's like, you know, it'll come back eventually. Yeah. Maybe not the first time it ever happened to you. But I wonder if at any moment while he's frozen, he's like, what if this is it? <laughs> what if I will never unfreeze? I'm sure. You don't, that, I, that would go through my head. Yeah. You know, and they're like, just how, like, I had to feel like claustrophobic in a way, so even though he's being out. But um, I go believable. What, I, I go you? believable as well. And then our final story, it's it's much shorter, but we got Maurice Moss smoking a cigarette you know, on his farm. His farm, you can do what he wants. Oh, yeah. Also, it's the 60s. Everyone's smoking. Yeah. Babies are, you know, taking a hit. Is he, he's farming wheat? We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Under a black market cheese. No, this is after that. It's very Gouda. <laughs> so he's smoking, and he sees something land um, in a field of lavender flowers. Yeah. And doesn't think it's a UFO at first, but then he sees it and it like pulls out like a pencil like thing. Yeah. And he like crumples to the ground. Yeah. And while laying on the ground, he sees it. Yeah. He saw this thing. It looks like he's like, is that cloud gate from Chicago? Yeah. This is the type of encounter. That's like a moment. Like when we tell listeners during listener submissions, yeah. it's like, yes. Like when we get like a long three page response, it's like, oh, this is a full episode here. But that's not to discount listener submission stories that are a paragraph or two. Because it's like paranormal. Mm-hmm. Not every paranormal story is a horror movie. Sometimes it's a creepy moment that you can't explain. Yeah. And that kind of is this. Like, it, it's, it's actually, I mean, it is, it's insane. Like it, it, like, it is the story he will tell for the rest of his life. If it happened to me, it would forever be the craziest story that ever happened yeah. to me. But in this episode, it's the smallest. You Could know? you imagine, though, just like that moment you're like, you're seeing something so confused and then you're zapped by something, and then you go the f- down, down to the. Can ground. you imagine that? Imagine the feeling. Your body is like your legs just give out. No, the Good thing there weren't like a big rock there. Oh my god, big that, lavender rock, <laughs> bubbly. That'd rock. That'd be very scary, though. Yeah, the whole thing is scary because you don't yeah. know what you're seeing. It's the, you also don't the, know their intentions. The either. fear of the unknown. Well, at least they left. Yes, they didn't take like, them. Yeah, my goddamn farm. That's what he said on the ground In into French. the dirt. Yeah. Where do you go with this one? It's a good sound. Bible. I'm gonna go believable again. It's a, just a moment. Mm-hmm. Hey, what else could it be? It's either it's like our good friend Jim Harold says, either he's lying, <laughs> yeah. or it happened. Yes, there's nothing he can mistake this for, it's true. unless it's like CIA, MIB. I think I don't think he's lying. So I'm still going viable. That's fair. I would, I probably would too, but I'm not. I'm gonna go believable. <laughs> so thank you so much. That is our episode on. 
Madeline Arnoux, Mary is to Wild, and Maurice Moss. Ooh, you're right. That is a, a tongue twister. It's going to be a big old graphic. It's going to be like one of those where people take Instagram and make like four blocks, one piece of graphic, like when you look at it. It's gonna yeah. Like that. I'm going to get a mural painted. Or you just go like like the French UFO encounters or something like that. Uh, because I, I, if you really want to know, because if anyone searches those names, oh, I want this episode to pop up. Makes sense. The French UFOs. Plus, we do, might do more French UFOs. I, you know, it's crazy really? though. It's like these were all pulled from different sources, so it's amazing. Like it wasn't like I found an article that's like I was actually thought you that you no, would have one centimeter, like one centimeter, one uh, meter tall. You have like aliens in France. Like I did not find that article. Like these just happened. That's interesting. To like the through line came as I started pulling them. Which I wonder is if it's true. That's all fake. <laughs> The uh, the mat, it, the first thing I had was the Madeline story, and I'm like, this yeah. just quite isn't enough, Charles. Mm-hmm. So uh, who is Charles? That's the second time <laughs> I've done that. So we appreciate you guys for listening. Hope you enjoyed this one. It's always fun to talk about aliens. Always a good time. It's always understated how creepy it is, though, because we we both get really into it, and it's yeah. a lot of fun. But god damn, it's scary. That second story especially got yeah. me, and I feel Ooh. bad for the dog. Me too. But we appreciate you if you are enjoying the podcast. If you're listening on Apple. You can leave a five-star review, uh, leave a comment, anything you're thinking about the show. And if you're listening on Spotify, not only can you leave a review, but you can comment specifically on each episode. And last episode, which was the Haunted Monte Cristo Sandwich Homestead. Oh, yeah. Lot Wait, of, was, you said a sandwich in there. I did. <laughs> I appreciate every single one of you that said, crikey. Me too. I mean, there's a lot of y'all, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Here's a couple of other comments we got. Uh, Wolf Co. said, made me want to eat a Monte Cristo sandwich. That's fair. Anthony said, I really like this episode. Totally unbelievable, but I really enjoyed it. Just one note. Please try and keep your friendship out of the episode. Ha ha, JK. <laughs> that's a great callback to one of our one star, three star, one star. It's a poor well, That's a one star. Yeah, we've been told to keep our friendship out of fun story. Yeah, we suck. And finally, Emma said, I'm from Idaho and hearing you guys say prairie <laughs> dogs are from Africa made my soul leave my body. I said they were from no, America yes, first. Listen, I do not want Charlie. I'm not taking Charlie down with me on that. I will take complete <laughs> ownership. To be you fair, made me question it though. To be fair, I, and, and I was still wrong, but I was thinking of meerkat. Yes, you I, were. In my yeah. head, I was saying prairie dog, but in my head, I was picturing a meerkat. This is my wife's favorite animal. I think the meerkat was the thing I was thinking about in the Cleveland Museum. They're very similar animals. The Please. zoo. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, they're probably something in the museum from Timon, right? He's he's a in the museum. I don't know which museum. The children's museum. (laughs) But seriously, we appreciate you. Also, you know what? If you don't want to leave a review, if you've already left left a review, share with a friend. You know, if you have, if you're in a paranormal circle, yeah, tell a friend. If you're having a night alone and or not alone with someone else, (laughs) and and you're playing games or want to whip out the Ouija board or (laughs) or you're watching horror movies, you know, if you just something like, hey. If you're into paranormal podcasts, check out Believe in Bizarre. Word of mouth goes a long way. And there's no way for us to track it, but we appreciate you for doing that. And it means a lot. And also, I think friends trust friends that suggest things. That's true. I I trust Tyler with many things. Yeah, when I tell him to listen to sports podcasts, I know he listens to every single one. Ooh, I try. And if you're all caught up on all our episodes, this is like the last one. You're like, oh, God, what do I do now? I got good news. What's the good news? There's a whole Patreon we've been building up for years now at this point. Hell yeah. We put, I think you said before, seven to eight pieces of content out a I'm month. Seven to ten. Seven Give to us ten. some credit here. We put a lot out. We put a lot out on Patreon. Charlie, uh, the only time Charlie leaves his editing desk is to come here and record a new episode. Uh, sometimes it feels like that. But yeah. This because I locked the door. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon, Charlie. But yeah, we've got a lot going on Patreon. If you want to join us there, that would be awesome. If you don't, you just want to listen to the regular feed, we'd love to have you there as well. Absolutely. So thank you guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast that exclusively buys our berries on the black market. Mm-hmm. As always, I'm Tyler. I'm Charlie. And catch us next week on Believing the Bizarre. Podcast as bizarre as you are. <laughs> <laughs>